Yesterday in a ceremony at St. James Palace, King Charles III was formally declared king. And today the late queen's body was driven from Balmoral Castle where she died to her official residence in Scotland. It is a monarchy in transition for the first time in 70 years. Let's dig into all this. Joining me now are two celebrated historians, Simon Sharma and Kate Williams. Kate is CNN's royal expert, and Simon received a knighthood for his contributions to history in 2019. Simon, Sir Simon, if, uh, since we're in the, in the title uh, mood. Um, you don't have to kneel <laughs> yet for it. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think the Queen um, inspires this awe in, in Badger's terms? She doesn't have any power. Well, actually, Badger says something else about the monarchy, and, uh, uh, which is very interesting. He described a constitutional monarch as need, needing to embody august ceremoniousness. Um, almost like a kind of secular devotional religion. But he also said something very startlingly modern. He said the monarch will only be effective um, if he or she is intelligible to or the ordinary person. And the extraordinary thing about the late queen is that, you know, from this incredibly narrow upbringing, not being allowed to go to school, um, you know, something that was criticized by people in the 1960s, like, um, John Gregg, uh, Lord Altrincham, who later said the reason why she behaves decently is because she's decent. But despite that very narrow upbringing, she managed absolutely to have the common touch that people responded to. And I think the bigger issue about her life and her reign, and indeed about constitutional monarchy, you've touched on in your remarks, is that one of the things which is most challenging, goodness knows for you and I who both live in the United States, is to find a way to be, feel part of a nation that is not simply captive to brutal partisan politics, which as we, you know, we know to our cost now, is not simply a matter of oppositional argument, but accusations of enmity of bitter enmity and what the monarchy provided was a way to feel part of this extended family of nation without being suspected of being on an ego trip lining your pockets yeah, yeah, as you yeah, yeah. beautifully vote marshal um, so that is an extraordinary gift if you think about other presidents as it were in germany for example not who are not politicians or in israel um, they do that, but nowhere near. Yeah, they can't yeah. possibly have this power of evoking being coming from the past as the Queen did. Part of it strangely seems to be that um, she, it's, it's birthright. She hasn't had to earn it. You know, think about the, the Japanese emperor, the Thai emperor, the, you know, there's a sense of almost veneration. But Kate, there is also an impressive public, public relations effort, right? I mean, they, if the Queen doesn't give it, it's fascinating. She has all this publicity, but she doesn't give interviews. She gave one interview in her life. And yet, here we are, we have been given this gorgeous backdrop of Buckingham Palace by the palace. They are conscious of the need to allow, you know, the public to venerate. Yes, Fareed, and I thought your take, your point that she's had to work so hard not to intervene, not to people to know about what she thinks, is very significant. To think she came to the throne so young, just 25, and really, as Simon was saying, her education had been quite sparse. She had had constitutional training, but she's expecting to be really watching her father for the next 15 years. That didn't happen. She was pitched into a new role, and a new role in which there was, you know, it was a changing world. It was the 1950s, post-war Britain, there was a lot of anger about what people had suffered. It was still a world of rationing. And also, it wasn't a time when people expected to see a working woman, especially not a working mother. Very few women were in positions of uh, power. We didn't have a female train driver or a female bank manager, and of course, not a female prime minister for another 25 years with Margaret Thatcher. So she was really, people doubted her. We, we look back on her reign as great, you know, her great memory, her great intellect, her, her powerful sense of duty. But there was doubt at the start. Winston Churchill called her a child. And so what you see is this massive exercise in producing and sort, of, and sort of creating this wondrous image of monarchy, which really we see the big push in the first televising of the coronation, that incredible moment of post-war Britain surrounded by all this light of the coronation, the Queen, this brilliant centre of this huge, this huge sort of huge performance, you know, this, all the pomp, all the ceremony, and there was so much support for that because 
initially there was a concern about that it would be too much to televise it or it would undermine the majesty of royalty. And, and really, when it was, there were all these newspapers saying the coronation, the monarchy, is no longer just for lords and ladies. We are watching it on TV. It's for all of us. And that, throughout her reign, she has been the television queen. She's used television to get her message out. And as you say, it has been a brilliant selling of monarchy. The Duke of Edinburgh said we fight an election every day. And that's what they did. I, I, have, I have 30 seconds before we go to break. I just want to ask mm. you, she, did she presided over the, the, the decline, the collapse of the British Empire, though. Yeah, she was, she was uh, other, other long-reigning monarchs, Elizabeth I and Queen Victoria, at the end of their reigns, Britain was much mightier and more powerful, so she had a much, much harder assignment. All right, uh, stay with us. Uh, we are going to be back with uh, Kate and Simon. Later on my GPS, uh, on GPS, we have an exclusive interview with Ukraine's President Zelensky. But first, I will be back in a moment with my guests here at Buckingham Palace to talk about Charles III and the difficult path that may lie ahead for the British monarchy. And we are back in London with the historians Simon Sharma and Kate Williams. Kate, Charles III, um, can he evoke that aura of inscrutable, uh, inscrutability because, you know, we know a lot about Charles. He has views on architecture, on nature, on urban planning, on Islam. Um, can he now step into that role of being the empty vessel that everyone puts whatever they want into? Yes, this is a good question. And there have been doubts about Charles before. Charles before. His opinion ratings are usually quite low, under 50 percent. But in his speech to the nation and also in his speech on accession, he made it very very clear that he's going to follow his mother's tradition of service and uphold constitutional monarchy and he also really said in not so many words I'm putting my causes aside so what he's saying is that he's going to be like his mother he's going to stay neutral stay out of politics in that respect and I think at the moment there's a lot of support for him and see how he keeps it but certainly she's a hard act to follow one of the things they've been able to do under Elizabeth is maintain this, this broader association with the world. Charles is now head of state in Canada and Australia, a bunch of Caribbean countries. Um, do you think that kind of thing is, is, is viable and Britain is not the power it once was? This is, almost seems a kind of uh, balancing act, you know? No, I think there's an enormous opportunity, actually. Remember, it was the Queen who wanted it to be not the British Commonwealth, or rather she was in full support that it should be just the Commonwealth. And she was very proactive about wanting it. I mean, there's a moment in her Christmas broadcast in 1983 got her into some trouble. So she wasn't always boring for it, where she said the great core existential problem of the world is the gap between rich and poor countries. The extraordinary thing about the Commonwealth is it's growing, it's not shrinking. There are members of the Commonwealth like Gabon, for example, and Mozambique that had no connection with British imperial past that are now members of the Commonwealth. I don't believe, um, I know um, the King, not very well, but we do know each other. I've been part of a teaching state school organization, which she's done wonderful work. I, with all, I'm sure he has the best intentions to button his lip. I don't think it's going to happen in quite the same way, and I don't think it should. I think he's got to be himself. Now, it so happens that the core, you, you said his love of nature, that's to undersell it. For 40 years, he's been rather obsessed with climate change, with environmental destruction. Well, that happens to be the greatest of all our present existential crises. It affects pandemics, it affects global economics he can he needs to find a way to finesse his strong views about that but you think of him on a stage with David Attenborough speaking to the world who who is going to be against that I think so it'll be a matter of reform and weirdly everything we know about his opinions might actually conceivably stand him in good stead so you pointed out his approval ratings let's be honest um, I mean I a lot below 50. I mean, the last one I saw, he was at 18 or 20 percent, whereas William is at 60 or 70. Do you think that kind of thing uh, affects? I mean, it must have an effect, right? To, to have this feeling that you're the. I think he's less popular than Will, all, all three of William's children. 
Yes, I think certainly Charles felt that. He felt he was a sincere man whose really efforts didn't come across. And certainly I think he'll be thrilled by all this joyous reception, and particularly the joyous reception of Camilla. It's always very important yeah. to him that she is queen when the queen, the eve of and the queen's... Yes. Camilla is very yes. popular. And the, you just think about how the queen made it very clear mm. earlier this year, on the eve of the anniversary of the 70 years of her accession, that Camilla would be queen. And he has repeatedly referred to her in his speeches. So I think that he'll be very heartened by this enthusiasm. But I do think we're in a honeymoon period. I think Charles has a lot on his plate. We are in a difficult world crisis with Ukraine. This, the country is also heading into a possible an economic crisis and heating sort of heat energy crisis and as you say the possibility that some countries may wish to they're, they're saying they're opening the conversation Jamaica Australia about no longer having the monarch as head of state Barbados did last year it may be that we see quite a few of the other realms saying no we no longer wish to have the monarch we wish to be a republic and things are changing and it's the monarch's role I think to make it very clear that these are decisions for the people he cannot interfere I agree with you Simon a lot of the things he said have been incredibly you know wise even on urban planning he was decades before his time the question I have for you is finally and we have about a minute is this is Britain's greatest soft power it seems to me that the monarchy and the BBC are, is what Britain is British hard power is not going to increase can it use the soft power I, th I think the opportunity is there really precisely look all around us you know I mean people have come from all over the world, they happen to be in Britain, because there is something extraordinary actually about a power that is not about political advantage. People are desperate all over the world, I think, for a kind of global citizenship that is not a zero sum game, that is not just simply about self advancement. So the possibility, you know, to actually exercise some sort of moral authority. Is, is really promising. Will it happen? We'll see. Sir Simon Sharma, Kate, pleasure to have you guys on. This is such a fascinating conversation. Next on GPS, we will take you to Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. I was there this week for an exclusive interview with the man of the hour, President Volodymyr Zelensky.